Well, hello everybody. Good morning. It's so good to see you guys today. Today is a special day because today is Connect Group Launch Sunday. And not only can you uh, sign up for that out in our foyer, out under the uh, awning, out on, under here under the building, uh, not only can you sign up there, but we are also allowing you to sign up virtually. You can go to uh, myjeffersonchurch.org and uh, you can get connected uh, to our Connect Groups uh, through our website there. I'm telling you, it's going to be an amazing Amazing, amazing day. Uh, listen to me. You got to know that that even though we don't meet personally uh, for some of these, some of these groups will be meeting personally, but a lot of these groups are going to be meeting virtually now. So for those of you, you've been a little scared, a little afraid to come to church or to get involved in Connect Group season, it's never been easier than now because we are having Zoom uh, virtual Connect Groups, and uh, but we're also meeting in person in some areas as the leader feels comfortable to do that. We're smack dab in the middle of a series called Made for More, where we see what God has truly made us for more than what we are currently living as or currently living like in our life. And the first week, we talked about how um, we were made uh, for a relationship with Jesus, that he doesn't want your religion, he doesn't want your practices. What God really wants is a relationship. He wants you. The second week we talked about you were made for legacy. Uh, that uh, can lead me into tjclegacy.com, which is where you can donate for our dream, the return home, uh, where we're going to our new facility just down the road here at the Jefferson Cotton Mill. We we're so excited about that. But if you want to hear more about that, you can go to our um, uh, second uh, sermon there. And last week, we talked about the fact that you were made for life. God made you for life. And what kind of keeps us from living that life that God has for us? And oftentimes, life only comes at the level of our submission, at the level of our obedience, and the level of our fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And so I really want to ask you to go back and watch all those sermons uh, this week so that you can get a full gist, a full list of what this series has been all about. But today, we're talking about made for more and that we were made for life together. We were made for life together. Being Connect Group Launch Sunday, I thought it was very appropriate that we talk about life together in this time and in this season. If you think about it, in the very beginning, I mean, Genesis 1, Genesis 2, God is forming everything, creating everything, speaking everything into existence. And, and the stunning idea or the stunning realization about why God wants us to be together kind of shows up in the first two chapters, three chapters of the book of Genesis. Because Adam was all alone. Adam was by himself. He had complete relationship with the Father. He had complete needs met. Nothing was wrong. Everything was perfect. He was not darkened by sin whatsoever at this point, yet God, in his infinite wisdom, saw that he had everything he needed, but even then, God still said in Genesis 2.18, he said, it is not good that man should be alone. Now, clearly, he's talking about a wife, and God uh, made man, and when God made man, then God made Eve, and when uh, Adam saw Eve, he went, whoa, man, that's a pastor joke right there, but anyway, uh, he made us all for that, and so before the fall, before any of the sin entered into the world, God said, we were made to be together. It's not good that man be alone, so it's very, very important. Now, if you fast forward, thousands of years after that, Jesus is sitting in a room with his disciples in what's known as the Last Supper or the Last Meal in the upper room there. And uh, he actually kind of echoes this same theme. So in John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, five chapters, Jesus has a conversation with his disciples. And in this conversation, he's mainly talking about two things. The first thing he talks about is the Holy Spirit. The second thing he talks about is relationships. And he's really echoing the most important fact of the Holy Spirit. He's talking about heaven as well, but the relationship of the Holy Spirit, heaven and relationships. And if you think about it, this is the final conversation he has before he dies. So it's a very, very important conversation, and he decided to just focus on these two or three things. In John chapter 13 is where we pick up. It says it was just before the Passover festival that Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father, having loved his own. In other words, his last night before going to the cross, he decided not to have a big sermon. He decided not to have a Mount of Beatitudes kind of moment. His last night before, he got together with his choice 
people, his small group, everybody, connect group. He got together with them. He said, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God, speaking of Jesus himself. He got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet. Nowadays, because of Christian, Christianese and church, uh, uh, the way we function in church, we think, oh, this is a great moment. This is the moment where Jesus washes his disciples' feet. And everybody was excited and everybody was okay. Really, in this day and age, Jesus doing this, it was the lowest form of servanthood. It wasn't like esteemed servanthood, like, oh, I'm choosing to serve my society or serve my community. No, no, no. It was the lowest form. Nobody wanted this job. In other words, on serve day, this would be the one that nobody would want to sign up for. This was the worst, lowest job that you could have it, because what you did is you saw unspeakable things. You saw people's nitty gritty feet. You saw stuff between people's toes that nobody else wanted to see, like that they didn't want you to see. I mean, that was the lowest. You did not look the person in the eye when you were washing their feet. That's how low of a job this was. It says that he began washing their feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who literally freaked out. Peter freaked out, and he said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? In other words, hey, God, I'm not comfortable with what you're doing. Jesus, I'm not comfortable with you getting that intimate with me, that nitty-gritty with me. Like, I need you at arm's length. I've really enjoyed the past three and a half years. I've really enjoyed this time with you. But listen, you're getting a little too close for comfort. I don't want you to see what's between my toes. And Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later... You will understand. In other words, many people don't understand this closeness principle. Like, we don't understand how important it is to have just a few people in your life, listen to me, that know what's in between your toes. This, this idea that Jesus brings to the forefront that began in Genesis chapter 2 and now is in John chapter 13. I mean, this idea that of, of you need some people in your life. It's not good for you to be alone. You need some people that know what's really going on, the nitty-gritty of your life. Somebody needs to know the personal and up-close, have the up-close and personal perspective into your life. And this is what Jesus is trying to teach his disciples so no, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. You know, that's the way we are in the South, especially the South with church. We put the church clothes on, you know, like we come in, oh, yes, bless God, glory to God. Oh, I've been good. How are you, blessed and highly favored? Like, you know, that's just the way we look when we come to church. You lie, you know you lying. You know good and well you beat your kids in the car before you got here, and then the church parking lot has magical properties to it, and you get out of the car after you just got through swatting your kids. Yes, bless God, I just know it here, bless and highly favored. I'm the head and not the tail above and not the, you know, like, like the, the, for some reason, when we get to the south of church, the church in the south, we have this, oh no, no, not me. Like, I've got it all together. I don't need help. I don't need you to get that close to me. But Jesus responded and said, unless I wash your feet, unless you allow me to get close, unless you allow somebody to get into the nitty gritty of your life, you will have no part with me. So why were we made for life together? Why is partnership so important, being together? I want to give you five things that partnership, five things that connect groups, five things that being in a small group is going to give you. And really it comes from these five chapters, John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. In all five chapters, Jesus outlines one individual thing or themes, one individual thing in all five of these chapters of why you need people in your life. Why Christianity is not a Lone Ranger religion. Why it's not you isolated by yourself. At no point, as a matter of fact, in the Bible, if you look at anybody who was ever alone, something bad always happened. Almost every single time. And I'm telling you, you were not meant for isolation. God meant for you to be together. And Jesus outlines in 13, 14, 15, 16, and chapter 17, five things, five reasons why we need to be together. We need to be together because we need to be, number one, serving one another. 
As believers, now we know this, our, our church, we've kind of cornerstoned our entire uh, philosophy on serving. Like we believe in serving and we know that we're supposed to be serving, but listen to me, it's not talking about necessarily you serving other people. Sometimes, listen to me, sometimes you need to be served. Sometimes you need to be taken care of. God forbid that you go through something in your life, but I'm telling you, when you go through things that are bad and that are awful and nobody is there to help you, nobody's there to serve you, it feels that much worse. It feels that bad. I've been a part of really, really dark days in a lot of your lives where children have passed, fathers have passed, husbands and wives, uh, mothers have passed. I mean, like, people close to you that you did not expect. And on one such occasion, I won't say who this was, but let's just say her name is Jill. On one such occasion, I, I got the phone call, and it was probably two hours between the time I got the phone call until the time I met with the person who had a very, very close loved one die, I mean, extremely close, totally unexpected. I go to Jill's house, and, I'm, and, and before I even got there, as I'm pulling in the driveway, there are cars all over this place, all over the house. Um, and as I get there, I walk into the house, and I discover that I was not the first one at the scene. But yet this person who was involved in connect groups at this church, their connect group leader was there. People within their connect group was there. There were probably seven or eight individual families represented there trying to serve, love on, take care of this person who had just gone through something. Matter of fact, when I walked in the door, I had people looking at me like, why are you here? And I'm like, I'm the pastor. It's what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm called to do this. I just want to check and make sure everything's okay. And the leader even looked at me and was like, hey, pastor, we got this. Hey, pastor, we're going to take care of them. Hey, pastor, we're going to make sure. And they did. I mean, they got meals ready. I mean, they made sure the, the meat platter was at the place. They made sure that the family was well fed and well taken care of. Anything they needed, cutting grass, anything going on, they took care of it. Why? Because you need to be around people so that when that day comes, you can be served. Because God forbid, but I, I, just, I just need you to know this, a Jill day is coming in your life. There's going to come a time where you're going to need people to help you. John 13 says it like this. When he had finished washing the feet, he put on the clothes and returned to his place. He says, you, do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher or Lord. Those are formal names that you call me. And rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet... In other words, I don't want to be the formal pastoral walking in with the tie and the tie clip and everything. Like, I want to get down to your level. I want to, I want to be on the ground level with you, in the dirt, in the grime with you. He said, now that I've washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. In other words, now that Jesus has served you, now it's your turn to serve others. It's your turn to be there for other people. I have set an example for you that you should do just as I have done for you you. We're all going to have Jill days. The question is, are you around people that are going to help you during those Jill days? May I just make a mention, when I showed up at their house two hours after the event had taken place where that person had died and Jill got to her house, and after two hours, there was not one family member there. It was, it was church people. And in that moment, I was like, wow, God, look at what you're doing. This thing is really, really working. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 says, each one of you should use whatever gift you have. Listen, in that moment, she had eight families and eight different gifts working in there. There were people that were willing to mow her grass, uh, cook her food, help write her uh, thank you cards for all the people that were helping. They are, I've been around cases where connect groups have helped you get through a divorce or help you get through separation of a loved one, whether it was a death or however it is. And it says, each one of you should use whatever gift he has received to serve others faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. We need to be together because we need to be serving one another and also be served. The second thing, we need to be together because we need to encourage one another. Because we all have those sick heart days. Those days where we're just not ourselves. Those days where, where we just really can't get it together. And listen, can I tell you something? I've gone through that I've actually gone through it here pretty recently. It doesn't happen all the time, but there are moments in my year, moments in the seasons of my life where I just sit there and I look at Chanel and I go, it would be so much easier to do something else. 
it would be so much easier to take a different route, a different, and there have been opportunities that have come up, but I know this is what God has called me to do. I know this is what God wants us to do, but there have just been seasons where I'm just down and the enemy's just attacking me and calling out my faults and calling out my failures, and there have been those sick heart days in my life. But Jesus said in John 14, he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. In other words, I want to encourage you. Because if you believe in God, then you believe also in me. I've, I found one very, very constant common thing to be true when it comes to this subject. Discouragement hits everybody at some point. Discouragement hits everybody at some point. And when you're discouraged, you are not <laughs> very smart. You make a lot of dumb decisions when you're discouraged. There have been times, like I said, where I've been wanting to quit. But just in that moment, somebody calls or texts and says, hey, I'm praying for you. Or I'll have somebody in my group. I'm a part of a group. I don't, I don't isolate myself. I'm not the pastor on high. I have people around me that, that I trust, that I connect with, that know my nitty-gritty stuff. And they call me and say, hey, are, I, I, are you going through something? Can I help you with something? It helps me. Hebrews 3.13 says, encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by discouragement. So that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. So not only do we need to be serving, not only do we need to be encouraged one, encouraging one another, but also, you know what, being around a group, being with people, you know what it helps you do? Produce. It helps you produce with one another. Listen, you can get more done when other people are there. You can get more accomplished when you have other people. This church, together, collectively, we've given over a, half a million dollars to missions. This church collectively, I could not have done that by myself. You could not have done that on your own. But listen, over half a million dollars. Why? Because we did it together. Because God has given us this one mind, one accord, and we're walking in one direction. Walking into the dream of this new facility, the return home, the legacy of the Jefferson Church, it can't happen by one person. It has to be a group effort. We can produce more when we're together. Jesus said it in John 15, verse 4 through 5. He says, remain in me, and I'll remain in you. There's two lines I want you to watch. He says, no branch can bear fruit by itself. No branch can bear fruit by itself. When you're alone, when you're isolated, when you cut off from that vine, you can't bear any fruit. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You're the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. And here he says it again, second line, apart from me, apart from my plan, apart from getting together with some people that really know what's going on in your life, apart from that, you can do nothing. This, this idea of us being together, producing together, it even has spiritual implications. In Deuteronomy 32, verse 30, as I was studying, I, I just kept thinking about this verse. It says, one man shall chase a thousand when you pray, but two can put 10,000 to flight, meaning there's more power when we're together. Listen to me, everybody. You can produce more. You can get more done with a group. I've been demolishing my, the inside of my house to get things ready for this baby. Can I tell you, when I did it by myself, I was discouraged. I was distraught. I got in fights with my wife. But as soon as I called five or six other guys to come and help me, all of a sudden, number one, it got done quicker. And number two, I kept my sanity. Why? Because when you're together, you produce more. And you have a greater effect for it. And it doesn't affect you as much. The fourth thing that we get from chapter uh, uh, 16, I'm sorry, chapter 17, the fourth thing is this, is that we need to be not only encouraging and producing, but we need to be praying for one another. I mean, that's what a group can really do. Uh, musicians, you could come. That's what a group can really do. We can be praying for one another. I love it. I love it when people say, I'm praying for you. I love it when people text me and say, hey, I'm thinking about you right now, because listen to me, I need that daily. I need prayer. I need literally God, I need him to focus on me every single day. I need you to point his attention my direction every single day. Why? Because listen to me, I, I've got two points to this. My first point is this. If I fall, many fall. And you say, well, that's just the nature of the job. 
That's just the nature of, of where you're at. And, you, and maybe some of you are like, well, that's a prideful thing to say. If you fall, many fall. And to some implications, it is true. I'm the pastor. If I fall, it could possibly hurt the church. Absolutely. But I put the same thing to you. If you fall, many fall. The lie of sin is that it only affects you. But when you have people praying for you, praying against the spirit of whatever, praying against you falling, praying to God for God to reveal himself to you, praying for God to heal you, praying when you have people praying for you, it's amazing the effect that it can have in your life. We'll get to John 16 in a second, but John 17 says, after Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and he prayed, I pray for them, I'm not praying for the world, <laughs> but those that you have given me. In other words, Jesus said, hey, hey, right now, I'll, I'll take care of the world in a second. But right now, I just want to pray for these, these group of people that you've given me in my life. I can't call 1,200-something names. That's, that's a very hard thing for me to do. But you know what I can do? I can pray for every pastoral leader that's here leading you. And I can train them to pray for the people that are under them and train for, th to, for them to pray for the people under them. All of our connect group leaders, I can train them to pray for each and every one of their connect group members by name every day. That way, we can produce more and we can get everybody covered through prayer. James 5, 16 says, therefore, confess your sins. Hey, take the mask off to somebody. I heard a pastor say this. He said, if you're the only one that knows your problems, if you're the only one that really knows your issues, you're in trouble. You've got to take the mask off. I'm not saying Facebook. I'm not saying Instagram. I'm saying, can you take the mask off? Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. That's when you will receive healing. Maybe the reason why your stuff hadn't gone away is because you haven't confessed it to who you need to confess it to really let somebody in the nitty gritty of your life, let somebody see what's in between your toes. You need to pray for one another. But the fifth and final thing comes from John 16. I skipped a chapter to come back to 16. We need to be together because we need to, number five, protect one another. Protection. In this world, in this day and age, I'd say protection is a very, very high priority. I'd say we really have to understand that we are in this thing together and we have to protect one another. John 16, verse 1. All this I've told you so that you will not go astray. That word astray in the Greek, it actually means scandal. In other words, scandal is something that comes down the line that you never saw coming. It's a snare in the road. And Jesus said, I'm telling you all this. I'm helping you with your relationships. I'm helping you with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because there's a snare coming. And I don't want you to trip and fall. Hey, everybody, listen to me. There's a snare coming in your life. There's probably one there right now. There is something that you don't see that if you trip and fall, it will affect everything. And when you're together with people, we can protect each other from that. Because you may see things in my life that I don't see. I see things in your life that you don't see. I'm not saying that you have to submit yourself to the entire church body, but I am saying you need a core group of people. If you don't have that, connect group's the best way to do it. Get in a group that has some lifelong implications, lifelong connections, where you can really know the nitty-gritty of people and help them. Why? Because that was God's design from day one. We need to protect one another. There's a snare coming. If <laughs> there's... If there's one thing I've learned in 10 years of ministry, it's this. I am one step away from stupid. One step. I've, I've, I've done this long enough to know it takes a lifetime to build character. It takes a lifetime to build people, people's esteem. They can take one step, one bad decision, can lose it all. I'm one step away. You're one step away from destruction. That's why you need somebody in your life to protect you. That's why you need somebody in your life to help see what you can't see. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 says it's better to have a partner than to go it alone. Share the work, then you share the wealth. And if one falls down, the other helps. But if there's no one to help, tough. Two in a bed warm each other. Alone, you shiver all night long. By yourself, you're unprotected. 
And maybe that's the way you feel right now. You feel unprotected. With a friend, you can face the worst. Can you, can you round up a third person? Because a three-stranded rope is not easily snapped. You need protection. You need people to see things that you can't see. When I was playing golf one day, it was, it was in the winter. It was about low 50s, you know, uh, high 40s, low 50s. And we, were, we went to a union golf course. And Judah that day, he was, he was with me. Um, I think it was a holiday or something. And Judah wanted to, he wanted to come with me. So I said, okay. So we got blankets and little hand warmers and stuff. It wasn't that bad. But, you know, we got him. And he sat in the car right next to me. And uh, me and Pastor Ryan and Stephen Banster, we all had our own individual carts. And, and I can remember uh, we got to this one tee box. And I put Judah, I parked him, put the brake on, you know, the golf cart, parked it on a hill and walked away. And I've always told him, don't touch anything. So he knows not to touch. He's an obedient kid. So I'm getting up to the tee box and I'm getting ready to hit. My back's to him and I'm looking down the fairway and I'm getting ready to, to swing a club. And all of a sudden I hear Ryan say, cart, 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 cart. And I pop up and turn around and Judah is going halfway down this hill Somehow the brake had popped and released. He didn't touch it. The brake had popped and released somehow. And he's heading fast down to a ravine that had a bridge with no sides. He was heading right for the edge of that bridge. And he would have fallen off into probably a 30, 40 foot drop. This is still messing me up thinking about it. Ryan ran down to that cart got in front of the cart, tried to stop the cart with his hands. When he couldn't do that, literally gave into the cart and his body is what stopped the cart from going over the bridge. Ryan Ginn saved my son. In that way, he saw something I couldn't see. He stopped utter disaster from hitting my family, from hitting my life, and I would be telling a very different story if I didn't have somebody with me. You're unprotected when you're not in a group. You're unprotected. You're not being prayed for like you should. You're not encouraging. You're not being encouraged. You're not being served like you should when you're in a group. There's one thing that I've, I've found, and I heard a pastor say this one time. I think it's, it's very, very true. That we, every single time, is better than just me. We, every single time, is better than just me. That's not just preaching that's the gospel from day one God said it's not good for you to be alone I want to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment watching online today I want to ask you how many of you are alone <laughs> and you feel like you're alone today I want to give you the answer the answer is number one a relationship with Jesus and number two a relationship with believers that can encourage you, serve you, protect you, produce with you, pray for you. You need to be with other people. That's biblical. But maybe your first step is you need to give your life to Jesus. I want to ask you, last week we had eight people give their life to Jesus. And I, I believe there's more out there right now. Online, I believe you're watching. And you right now, you feel alone. That sick heart day, it's there all the time. And you just need to be released of that. Right now, you need to give your life, surrender your life to Jesus. I want to give you that opportunity. The Bible says, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and you will be saved. So I want to ask you to pray this with me. Say, Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Right now, I receive your grace. I repent of everything I've done, and I surrender my life to Jesus from this day forward. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for the love that you've shown me. Now help me to live a life that's different from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Hey, everybody, thank you so much for being here today. Again, if you want to go online or you can sign up in our foyer, but you can go online and sign up virtually uh, for all of our connect groups. It's going to be the best decision you've ever made. I'm telling you, I cannot wait to hear the stories and the testimonies of what God's going to do in people's lives simply by gathering together, simply by being obedient to his word and not being isolated and not doing life by themselves. So go sign up online. If you're, if you're watching online, go sign up online. You don't have to be a part of our church, but just go get involved in a group. Can't wait to see you. God bless you guys. Well, thank you so much for joining us today here at the Jefferson Church. We pray that you were blessed and encouraged. If you gave your life to the Lord for the very first time or rededicated it during today's service, we would love to know. If you would, send us an email at office at myjeffersonchurch.org. It would be an honor for us to be able to walk you through your next steps as a believer. Have a great day, and we are so glad to call you our online church family. See you soon.